His Hi. Name. Ah. Hi. Ah, now we can hear you. Okay, welcome, MK Pindris. Uh, thank you for joining us today. On behalf of uh, William Darrow, Malcolm Honline, Diane Loeb, and myself, I'd like to welcome you here to our gathering of uh, members of the Conference of Presidents. Uh, just as by way of introduction, uh, MK Pindris was elected to Knesset first in 2019 as a member of the United Torah Judaism Party and currently serves as chairman of UTJ's, UTJ's uh, parliamentary group. He also serves on the Knesset's Economic Affairs, Science and Technology and House Committees. And prior to his election to the Knesset, he was the head of, he directed the Haredi Institute for Public Affairs, was a member of Jerusalem City Council and served as uh, Deputy Mayor of Jerusalem for 10 years and following his service in the IDF, uh, uh, Yitzhak Pinterest was elected mayor of Beitar Elite for six years. So uh, welcome MK Pinterest and the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, it's for sure an honor for me to be uh, with you uh, on Zoom at least, uh, if not uh, hosting you in Jerusalem, like we were regularly seeing most of you. Well, at least a big part of the people that are here in the, this gathering I met in the Jerusalem personal, some of them even in New York. So uh, welcome. Yes, we're here again. Uh, I think I was last year in the, uh, the hotel in Jerusalem. We met uh, the same group. And again, it was before elections. Like I said, Israel, uh, where Jews were a startup nation, we uh, established something new. You could have ongoing elections for two years, and in the middle, you even vote. And those, it's not a year of elections, it's two years of elections, and you vote in the middle a couple of times. I hope we're going to stop now in this March, and we're not going to have in uh, September another uh, that. Even though it would be very uh, helpful, because maybe then we could gather together before the elections. Uh, I'll say maybe a few words and then uh, ask your questions. Israel, like the whole world, is going through uh, the challenges of the COVID. Uh, we do do it a little bit different than most of the countries. Uh, just to get the idea, uh, a majority of the adults in Israel, okay, if uh, 43, 44% uh, uh, is, is this morning, got already the, the, the vaccine. So probably I would say that a majority of 60, 70% of uh, the adults, because uh, no one gives the, the children under the age of 16, if the adults got the vaccine in Israel, and Israel's really waiting for the next uh, two, three weeks uh, uh, that things will open because we'll have, like I said, the majority of the people uh, having the vaccine. Just to give an idea, over 80% of the people over the age of 60 already got it. Uh, people that are sick over the age of 60 went down in 80% in the last couple of weeks. Even the general, the total numbers didn't go down, but at least uh, as far as uh, the, those people be getting sick uh, over the age of 60. Oh, my hero. It went down uh, uh, to 80%. Most of the people that are getting sick now, and even it's almost the same numbers that were before, are younger uh, uh, adults, children, and uh, uh, that brings down also the numbers of people that are uh, uh, it's 50% that it was two weeks ago, okay? Those are the numbers, and that's why people in Israel are feeling that we're towards the end of it. Hopefully that's what it's going to be, and it's, of course, part of the political environment over here, uh, we had Prime Minister Netanyahu yesterday on TV. That was most of his show was saying, okay, I'm bringing in vaccines and we're on our way out of it. Okay, and that was uh, most of his uh, show yesterday. And politically, it, it for sure is going to have some kind of effect. We don't know yet what. For two years, nothing really affected the elections. We were there, 60 on one side, 60 on the other side, 59, 61, but it's all the same. And that's what brought us to, like I said, the ongoing elections again and again. Uh, I'll maybe in a few words what uh, our community is uh, suffering in this, uh, in what we're going through. As a matter of fact, I can't say the community alone is suffering because the whole, everybody in Israel is suffering. What people are concerned in Israel, first of all, is the, fu the future of their uh, finance, how are they going to uh, succeed? 20% of the small businesses are before bankruptcy or in some kind of uh, process of bankruptcy. 
about 20% of the small businesses, um, over a million people, okay, out of a population of, uh, it's almost 25% of the population that works, uh, are looking for jobs, are out of jobs, uh, businesses are closed, like in the whole world, the education, children are for the last year, almost most of the time, at home since last year, March, until now. Uh, those are uh, things that are uh, disturbing every home in Israel. And again, be, of course, it becomes part of the political issues. The uh, Haredi community suffers a little bit more, uh, I would say, for three, uh, three major re reasons. First of all, the, the culture of life is more of a community, okay? It's more of a gathering. It starts in Shul and Shachris, goes through to Min Chemayim, but not only that, an average uh, Haredi family lives in a home, let's say there's 40 apartments in a building, each apartment has 10 people living there, that means that from a, a door walks out, 400 people walk in and out every day. So even if they're closed at home, they meet 400 people only in their specific, not even black, because we're talking about the specific entrance, if all do it with the block in the backyard, you could be talking about two, three thousand. When it was mentioned before, I was very big tired, so I remember then we used to count three thousand children a day in each of our four big parks that we had in Big Tower. We have three thousand children a day. So even if you have kids at home, they're really three thousand people. Okay, and if you have a gathering or a regular family does a, a, a wedding only with brothers and sisters, it can be three hundred people because brothers, sisters, cousins, first cousins that are dear, or uh, nephews, not even cousins, right? First nephews is, uh, and they're up to 300 people. So that culture of life brings a lot of, uh, uh, I would say, a lot of challenges in the community. The second uh, big challenge is that, like I said before, because most of, uh, government officials that make decisions uh, don't really have the feeling what the culture is. So when they give out uh, of the quarters, it's not always uh, fitting into a culture of life. And then the same thing basically happens with the Arab community over here, the same problem, okay? It's a different style of life, different way of life, different way of meetings, different things that disturb them or don't disturb them. And uh, uh, that brings a lot. Of course, it brings a lot of criticism. It's enough to have, uh, and I'll just bring a small example, there was a big Leviathan in Eretz Israel, or David Salavechik, uh, uh, and Bris passed away. On a normal year, not in a COVID year, not in Corona, and we would probably have 200,000 people in a Leviathan like that. So 95% of that 200,000 stayed at home. But enough to 5% that did not stay at home, that brings you to 10,000 people. It's without buses coming out of the town. It's without uh, uh, even going out. Pictures like that were shown on the uh, on channels and, and TV, and that brought a lot of uh, criticism to the uh, Orthodox community, to the Haredi community. And these are uh, challenges that we're facing. But like I said again, most of the elections this time is around the COVID government functioning, not functioning, how functioning. Of course, with the government, that's uh, with two prime ministers, basically, because uh, they can't make any decision without, uh, and together with the uh, white, that brings to a lot of decisions that are, that are taking time. People that feel uncomfortable trying to pressure because of the political uh, issue, that brings to a lot of times that the government is, sits for 30 hours or 40 hours until they make a decision. People don't feel comfortable and they know what decision would be made. And now what's publicized when the government started talking is by the end of those 40 hours. These are things that are uh, uh, bringing to things that are uncomfortable. And that's why most of the elections are around uh, those issues. Even there's other issues that we could face, but those are most of the issues that uh, we're right now uh, facing. And I'll be happy to hear any questions. I'm here. Okay, wonderful. Thank you for those remarks. Uh, we'll go to Q&A now. For those of you who have a question, if you kindly use the, uh, the hand raise function in the app, and I guess I'll kick it off. So, um, so uh, MK Pindris, you, you know, I see, of course, uh, economic affairs and science and technology are your portfolios, and you talked about now that the biggest issue 
with uh, with voters is the, is the economy. So how how do you see um, what are your priorities since there's been no budget? How do you how do you see Israel coming out of this? How is Israel able to continue to maintain its uh, its scientific and technological edge throughout all this, which is so critical to its security? And then and then how how do these emphases still allow us to uh, pay attention to the existential threats around us? Okay. I'll start with the, the financial. It's what we hope is going to happen, meaning that in, I would say in the month, two months from now, we're out of it. That really means that Israel got into, a, I'm talking now as a government, okay, to a deficit of uh, 100, uh, 120 million uh, uh, shekels. Uh, right now, they're 105. Let's say they'll get to the, the last uh, uh, plan that Tanya was trying to pull together these hours now. If you read about it, it's going on between him and Gantz. We'll get to, let's say, even 130, 140. That's something that Israel could uh, uh, um, take on themselves because you're talking about the yearly budget of uh, uh, Israel is 413 billion, uh, billion. So if you're talking about 130 billion, right? So if you talk about 450 billion, you're talking about 25%, 30% of uh, taking a loan is something that a country could survive and go through. That's, and I'm, I'm, I'm talking at the national level. If you're talking about the businesses and the people, we do think that uh, for political reasons, okay, a lot of those hundred, a lot of those hundred and fifty, uh, were giving out in a political way by giving people money instead of uh, encouraging businesses. If there'll be a stable government by twenty three of March, okay, I believe the government would change a little bit where the truck is going and try to put in more in helping businesses uh, uh, employ people than giving the employers money not to go to work. Because today, just to understand, even I'm part of the government, you know, I had this morning a scene with the uh, Bundestag, uh, the head of, I'm the chairman of the Bundestag German-Israel uh, friendship, and I said over there something that, when you're part, we have members of the parliament, so I said, when you're part of the coalition, you have to say everything the government does is right. And when you're part of the opposition, they, well, even when they're wrong, and when they're, you're part of the opposition, you have to say everything the government is doing is wrong, even when they do something right. So, yes, you're asking me if politically, I don't believe that, uh, and it's not only me, Gaffney is uh, the head of our party and he's the head of the finance committee. Uh, we believe that it has to be putting more money in businesses, helping employment, then giving money people for to stay at home and not try to get a job, which is a plan that went through until July. That is something that will have to change. And I understand that for political reasons, uh, the government did change it until now, but that's something that could get us out. If it's something, like I said again, that's going to start ending in the month or two of now, and we're talking about of a deficit of 30% of a yearly budget, a one-time thing, that's something that Israel could uh, get through. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, next question, um, Rachel, please. The next question is from Mark Klein of the ZOA. Uh, hi. Um, <laughs> I wonder if you could uh, inform us as to, compared to five or 10 years ago, what percentage of the Haredian uh, are now working compared to what they used to be uh, re in regular jobs, what percentage and what types of jobs? And also, has there been a change in the percentage of Haredim from five or 10 years ago going to college uh, compared to uh, today? The, the Haredi community in Israel, okay, is very careful to keep a uh, 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 culture of life uh, for educational reasons, okay, for, for our next generations. So if you're asking how many, uh, is there encouraging today already to go to college? The government is trying it for years. It gets up from 2% to 3%, to 4%. It doesn't really make real changes. And most of the times, like Jewish minds, it uh, works very good, okay? They go to all kinds of uh, things to get an education and uh, uh, things that don't really mean real college. And they play games and the government shows numbers that go up. No, so there's no real change on that. 
There is physically uh, Haredi trying to get jobs. Uh, there is a need for more than that. Uh, there's for sure a larger number. But again, the government focuses uh, for political reasons. For example, more on men than women. Even on women, you could encourage uh, a lot more uh, for better jobs. Uh, yes, the government doesn't let anyone that didn't uh, have any college to get into any job that has anything to do with the public affairs. A person like me I could never get a job in any uh, company that works with government, not only government companies. Yes, that's how it is. And these are things that we just, we changed, we're changing the laws the whole time. We're keeping on trying to change regulations to let in more people to get uh, jobs. By the end of the day, uh, the focus, uh, I would say, also professionals, but more politicians, or if I, we have 250 uh, Haredi, 1,000 Haredi homes, in Israel, and we have 60,000, about 70,000 that are sitting in Kerala, they're focusing always on those 70,000. Instead of focusing on the 250,000 women, right? And we're on the 170, 180,000 that are not in Kerala. The government is trying always to focus on that. And that's one of our political battles that we're fighting. And we're doing progress, not enough. We should do a lot more. Okay, Rachel, next question, please. The next question is from Farley Weiss of the National Council of Young Israel. Yes, hi, uh, appreciate you coming on. The questions I have is that, how is it going with, I think the one of the problems is poverty in the Haredi sector and the lack of men working, whereas the women working is the same as the secular world. Uh, is that improving? And, uh, and what is the view of the Haredi community? Is it uh, changing towards the IDF with the, with the Nachal unit uh, and other things like that of happening? So uh, I'll, I'll make, make back. I have a little bit of a different, uh, maybe I see the Haredi community has a little bit of a different uh, view about that. And I'll say why. If an average woman that's working in the Haredi community by the end of the day comes back home, okay, with a thousand dollars, okay, and uh, uh, average job in Israel, you make uh, two and a half thousand dollars. I think for increasing the economy in Israel, if you would increase, like I said before, those 250,000 women from one thousand dollars, let's say to two thousand, I won't exaggerate, not to two and a half thousand, the uh, effect that that would have on the economy in Israel and on the Haredi economy is a lot more then you would try to get those uh, 60,000 guys that are uh, sitting in Yeshiva and getting them out to work for $1,000, okay? Because I didn't go to the uh, academic and I didn't learn enough math, so that's what makes me think that 250,000 increasing from 1,000 to 2,000 is a lot more than increasing 60,000 to 1,000. And, and that, th those are real numbers. And again, also for Haredi men, if you would, uh, uh, use uh, uh, what Haredi men could bring into the uh, to work, right? And use them and let them go into work without uh, um, bureaucracy or regulations, trying to get them out of jobs. You would make a lot more for the economy in Israel than uh, fighting uh, those things. That's one. Yes, that I could tell you, because of the COVID the last year, and generally because there's no, uh, 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 like I said before, there's a million people that were fired in the last couple of months. Uh, so, of course, those are not issues that are right now on the table. But if you're talking to me a year ago, those were the ideas. I hope that we will get out of uh, uh, this crisis now, okay? And we'll start doing plans. We could get in plans also for those things, like I said before. Increasing women, increasing men that are in the uh, workforce now, right? Increasing their income instead of being uh, 50 or 40 percent, then their, uh, their uh, uh, non Haredi colleague it would get it to the same numbers. Thank you, Rachel. Next question, please. The next question is from Mayor Melnick. Good morning or good afternoon. Well, My question is to you, the media portrays the police department being harassing the Haredi and we do not see so much how not non Haredi or the secular that are being uh, punished 
Ohares, is that a policy or is just the media doing it? Or the non-secular also get the same harassment and uh, stronghold what the police are doing? Because this zoo is not for my voters and it's for people like that, so I could be honest and I'll, I'll tell you, it, it's not a policy. I'll tell you what it is, okay? And I'll be, I'll be very honest with you and I'll tell you what it is. In generally, the police in Israel, okay? Uh, as a matter of fact, I don't know how it works in other countries, but in Israel, that's how it works. They work very not professionally and very not with some kind of a strategic plan. What they do is they're, they're, most of the officers are busy with PR. So like you asked now, if you have a picture that works in TV and goes through, that's what they do, okay? It's a cycle, one does the other. And I, I'll just bring you an example that uh, a lot of people in Israel saw it and some people outside of Israel, uh, right before Sukkot, okay? There was a channel too, Amut Stein in Israel, a big picture of two big sukkahs that were built in Me'a Sharm for uh, Simchas Beis HaShem and Simchas Terra, which is illegal to have Simchas Beis HaShem and Simchas Terra, no, not Simchas Terra, Simchas Beis HaShem, because that's what you do in sukkahs. It was illegal. The police, instead of tearing down those sukkahs or arresting whoever built it or doing something to stop those events, went into a street right by Me'a Sharm every night, threw in grenades, running it with cops with sticks, beating up everyone that was there. Then they had a nice video going up on TV and saying, look at the police. Yeah, they're not afraid. They're going into everywhere. They don't really work with a strategic plan to do things. And they and again, if there's a big article that in Haredim are not listening to orders of Corona, or there was a chassid, unfortunately, which I think was wrong, and went out against it, all of us, at least in our party, went out against it, if there is a, a, a wedding like that that's shown on TV, the next day you see three cops walking into a, any a Haredi community, right, and fighting, and then starts a fight, and then they have police going in. And the next day you can show on TV, look at the police, they're doing a great job. It's not a policy that someone decides, it's a cycle that does itself. And, and the, the cycle has to be stopped. We have to do it in the same way. What I do is I get on TV and say what I'm telling you now. I explain it to the audience. And the next day I get a phone call with the police. Why are you saying it? I said, because that's what you're doing. Okay. So the next thing they do is they take uh, uh, cops and they run into a Balfour uh, demonstration and do the same. And I'm telling you, that's not what I meant. That sukkah has to be torn down. That chasana has to be closed down. That doesn't mean you have to walk into a Haredi area and start fighting. I, I, I think that, that the problem is that they don't do it professionally. It's not a question of a policy. It's a lack of policy. Thank you. Rachel, next question, please. The next question is from George Klein. George, you're on mute still. There I'm you go. On mute. First of all, I, uh, I don't envy you. Um, there was a man in America called Irving Bunim, going back to the 40s, who said, I don't mind, who's the head of, founder of the Young Israel, who said, I don't mind them throwing stones at me, it's only the size of the stones. And uh, I think it's come to a point where when we say, have you mispal malchus, that we're even praying and being misbelled shlem of malchus of Israel today. Um, my credentials, I'm not a member of an official organization, but a member of many organizations. I was in the room with Rav Ram Kutla. Rabbi asked my father to become chairman of Chinuch Hatzmoy. And he was chairman for 21 years of 70,000 students. George, uh, I apologize. I, I don't I'm going to ask the question. Yeah. I'm going to ask the question, sorry. How do you bring about some kind of understanding of what the questions are being asked? Because it's really a sense of a lack of mask wearing, other problems, gatherings, that people begin to get, they don't understand what's going on. How can you help erase the image of what's going on in Israel and around the world? 
I, I, it, it, this is one of the, the, the questions you just asked is the most difficult issue that we're facing in the, in the press at least for the last uh, couple of months. And I'll tell you the truth. I, I go out more than my other friends, okay, that are, don't get on to, uh, the press and TV and have interviews and explain. I want to tell you two things. First of all, and I'm having today also two channels in Israel. When you tell people the truth, it goes through. The, the, uh, what goes on in press doesn't buy people in the end. It sometimes works for a week. And I'll bring you an example. Uh, uh, Reb Chaim Kanievsky asked from the beginning, March last year, please find a way that children could keep on studying, okay? And every time when there's a closing, the first week everybody starts attacking and bringing a video of Rebhaim Kanevsky saying open the schools and saying you're a country in the country, you're doing whatever you want. And we just have to catch our breath for one week and you have everybody in the media, that's what happened this week, okay? Two weeks ago, everybody was attacking. Every day on television, everybody was attacking. Two weeks ago, everybody in this country today you know, that gets up on TV says, that rabbi was right. We're ruining our children. And I'm not talking about the from community. Okay, you have in our arts articles the last three days. You had in almost everywhere, having people got in. I got a television up today, I don't have to explain. Two weeks ago, I was attacked. Today, I don't have to have it explained. And I'll, I'll tell you an article that's going to be publicized in, in, in two hours from now. I went through with a, with a TV uh, interview that was walking down the street with me and asking me about the Hassans. And I told them there was two chasanas that happened, unfortunately, and I think it's wrong. And you guys were showing it for a month and a half on TV three times a day, that same picture of the same chasana again and again. And then I pick up my hand, and I'm in the, I live in the old city, whoever doesn't know, and I show up our midst of walking down the street, and I say to them, do you, do you know, I saw it to the woman that was interviewing, do you know this is illegal? She says to me, why? I said, because the rules say you could have 10 people, I see 40 people walking down to a bar mitzvah. And I said, would you do that on TV for three, for a month and a half, four times a day, showing that picture of people not doing the regulations? So she says to me, why do you think I won't do it? I said, because they vote for Gidon Saar. And I just like was, went off my mind. She walks over, and it's going to be in Channel 1 in two hours from now. And she walks over, and she says to them, who do you guys vote for? She says, not Netanyahu, I'm voting for Saad. And, and, and that was the end of it. I'm telling you, it, it takes time. Sometimes you have to catch your breath for a week, but people know the truth. Like I said in the beginning, when Reb Dovid Salavechik Slavaya had to have 200,000 people, and by the end of the day, you had 10,000, the 10,000 isn't okay. But you have to have a picture that 190,000 people stayed at home, like myself and my friends, 190,000. Because a regular Levite like that in is 200,000 people. And that, we have to get, I'm sorry, again and again up and saying it and making that statement. And I'm telling you, by the end of the day, you see it doesn't change the polls. Netanyahu is not losing because of that. He's going up with polls. It's not changing because of other issues. Uh, we, I hope it's going to change in, in March. But by the end of the day, people know the to appreciate the truth when you say it direct. And I'm not saying there's not things we have to fix in our community. There's for sure things that have to be fixed. Like I said, every event that's illegal should be done. People that go without masks should be fined. But you have to give the real picture and not try to give the, the wrong picture. Thank you. Uh, Rachel, next question, please. The next question is from Mindy Stein of Imuna. You're on mute, Mindy. There okay. you go. I did. Thank you. Um, thank you for serving in the IDF. But my question is, how come there's so many Haredim? How do they rationalize not going to the army when there's a mitzvah, uh, um, mitzvah milchama, that they must go to the army, that they must fight if it's, uh, if it's a milchamet mitzvah? How do they rationalize that and not go, not serve? I'll tell you how they rationalize it, and uh, I'm, I'm probably pretty sure that I'm not going to convince you, but I'll just try to tell you what the idea is that you should 
Just to give you the idea that there's a side to it. I'm not saying that I'll convince uh, someone that doesn't think like that. I'm probably not going to convince him, but I can tell you one thing. We believe in the Mitzvah, at least like by David HaMelech, 50% had to stay and learn. And, and, and learn. That's how David HaMelech's army used to look like. And that's how in the past uh, wars were, uh, were being done and won. Unfortunately, okay, we have only 8% of uh, Israeli uh, uh, population by the age of 20, okay? 9% are sitting and studying. I really hope that we'll get to the numbers of 50, 60%, and then we could have 50% of them going and joining the army, and 50% not. The future of the Jewish nation, and now I gave an idea to David Abelich, it sounds far, but I wanted to say one thing for sure. And I'm sure that you're the, uh, in New York, you know that, because you, or wherever you are and outside of Eretz Israel. The Jewish nation, 2,000 years, stayed as Jews because of our tradition. If we won't have at least 10, 15% that are sacrificing their life to sit and study, we don't have a future as a nation. We were dear because we had that. To feel comfortable, okay, now we have a state, we're gonna stay a Jewish, a Jewish nation without that, it's not gonna work. We tried that for 2000 years and we saw that's how we stayed as a nation. And communities that it did happen, we know that we're losing by percentage, more and more of their children is remaining as Jews. So that tradition, okay, those, eight, nine, or 10 percent that are sitting and studying today, that are keeping us as a nation to continue and stay as a nation by the end of the day. That's what we believe, and we believe that it contributes to, to the Jewish nation, at least, at least, like a, a, a young boy that serves in the army. Thank you. Uh, Rachel, next question, please. Next question is from Malcolm Holmline. Hi, uh, and thank you for doing this. Uh, I would like to ask you, do the Haredi parties have a position per se, I don't know what happened there, um, about foreign affairs? You've discussed a lot about the domestic issues, given the challenges that we face. What, what about the foreign policy agenda? And on the domestic agenda, there are increasing voices of anti-vaxxers. Are the religious parties doing anything in an organized fashion to counter those voices? and to assure that everybody gets vaccinated. Uh, of course, I think I, I was the, one of the first people that went with the chief rabbi to get a vaccination on the first day. On the first day, me and Rev Lau, we went together to Shari Tzedek to do that. I went to Rebchaim Kanievsky, the first video that came out, since a lot of videos came out. The uh, religious uh, towns, okay, are going out everywhere, everywhere with, uh, 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 today there was a big tar in Bnei Brak, everywhere to get people to get the, the, the vaccination. So yes, uh, we do uh, a lot. The headlines of the official Haredi papers, uh, which are our official Haredi papers, is three Haredi papers, Amotia, Yatet, and Amevaser. That's their headlines for the last month. You, you open up, you think it's uh, what they say in Israel, a kupat cholim, a headline, but those are <laughs> again and again going back to making sure that most people there was Piskei Aloha giving out of all the body didn't, that a teacher that won't go and be vaccinated can't come back to his job, or Yeshiva Bacher that won't be vaccinated, she can't get back to Yeshiva, it's going out of all the body didn't again and again. And yes, uh, we're doing a lot of work uh, to get that done, because uh, we think it's uh, something that's uh, to get out of where we are now. Yes, the answer is yes. And the foreign policy agenda of the parties? I would say we really believe in uh, uh, not getting to, to right wing and to left wing because of the, like you said, the, the foreign policies. We try not to fight for our agenda and foreign policies because of the uh, reason of the question before, because we deserve less of the, uh, <laughs> For people that say, okay, you guys don't serve any out of the army, who are you to tell us what to, what to do uh, here or here? And Israel was blessed in the last 10 years with a prime minister that very much succeeded, and we're backing him very much because he succeeded until now. We hope with Biden also, we're still waiting to see how it's going to work out, but yes. 
Thank you. Rachel, next question, please. The next question is from Fred Zeidman of the Council for Secure America. Fred, you're muted. Still muted. Still muted. Your, your, your sweater is very bright, but the sound is muted. There we go. How's that? Okay. I'm a Texan. You know, this is Longhorn colors. So it's a, the uh, Biden administration, back to the George Klein conversation earlier, really seems focused on a new deal for Iran. Uh, how do you see that playing out? And what do you think the Israeli government's uh, role should be in any of those discussions? Iran is a danger to Israel, okay? The agreement that was before under the Obama administration was a very uh, dangerous threat to Israel. Okay? Uh, how to do it politically, I think you guys here in Zoom could know better than me. How to do it politically uh, to get through by the administration to, uh, to explain that and to convince that. But uh, we all know Iran was keeping on doing it secretly more, secretly less, doing it in this way or another way. They have to be under pressure to stop because it for sure is a danger, a major danger for Israel. We see it now after the Avram agreements, okay, that in this area, there's a danger of a strong Iran, not only the nuclear, nuclear weapon, okay? We have Hezbollah on one side, we have the Hamas on the other side, right? We have what's going on in Yemen. In this area, to let Iran do whatever they want is very, very dangerous to Israel. No doubt that the Prime Minister, whoever is going to be, and I, of course, hope that is going to be, but whoever is going to be has to make sure that's not going to happen. How to do it politically correct? With the, uh, with the the Biden administration, I really think that the audience over here now on this Zoom could do a lot better than me in giving advice to, uh, to Israel how to do it politically correct. But bottom line, it's dangerous to get back to a deal like it was in Obama. It's very, very dangerous and is a big threat to Israel. Thank you. Uh, and for our final question, William Daroff, our CEO. William, please. Great, thank you very much, uh, Arthur, and uh, thank you, uh, MK Pinterest, for being with us. Uh, we appreciate uh, hearing from uh, all sectors of uh, the Israeli political scene, and it's great to have you here on behalf of UTJ. Uh, I wonder to sort of uh, wrap up your discussions of uh, the Haredi and the military and the, the news coverage uh, and, the, and the like, and, and Mort Klein's question about uh, Haredi in the workforce and, and Farley's questions and, and Mindy's questions. Um, if you can sort of put on your uh, looking in the future uh, and thinking, you know, three or four months from now or five or six months from now when we are, God willing, out of the, the immediate COVID crisis, uh, what efforts uh, need to be undertaken to ensure that uh, the Haredi and the non-Haredi are, uh, are, are brought back together and that the, the tension that has erupted uh, over the years and, and particularly over the last uh, 10 months or so uh, dissipates? What, what do you see as a way to try to get back to uh, status quo uh, ante uh, before Corona, and then, uh, and then obviously to take it a step further and to try to uh, continue down a road of, uh, of, of trying to ensure that there's more unity rather than division uh, amongst uh, our peoples uh, in the promised land. And thank you again for being here. Okay, I'll start with the headline, and I think that'll provide the three uh, areas of three issues. The headline is, I think that the Corona taught us what I started with in the beginning not dealing with a culture and a group professionally, only politically, doesn't work, okay? It doesn't work. It doesn't work with Corona, and it doesn't work with anything. It doesn't work with, uh, with, uh, with the infrastructure for jobs or uh, for education, for anything. I think that'll convince a lot of people in Israel, okay, that you have to zoom in and build strategic plans that make sense and works with the community. I'll bring as an example the, the, uh, the issue of employment. Taking 75% or 80% of the people that are in the employment work are on their way or they want to be here, which means women, which is 50%, okay? And let's say another uh, 60, 70% of the men. So we're up to 160, 170% of the population. And building real plans, how to incur, uh, increase their income to a normal average salary. That's the proposal. Same thing in education. 
Instead of fighting the Haredi education and trying to fight and close it down and opening institutions to try to close it down, which doesn't work and it's been going on for 70 years in Israel, is saying, no, let's see how could we increase. There's something over here. There's a half a million children that are studying in schools. Let's see how we increase those schools, right? In, in their uh, grammar, in their culture, and bringing them more into the society, into jobs, into things like that. And I think the corona brought a lot of people to understand that this, this is the real challenge over here. So that's in the education, that's in the, the workforce. And I want to say one thing that for sure happened in the last years. The story of the army went down. People are less uh, busy with it. Because, again, they figured out that it doesn't really make sense. The Supreme Court is still dealing with it, but uh, I would say even the, the most of the politicians are left and right today saying, let's just drop it. That's not an issue. We have other issues to deal with. So I think that if we'll deal with it professionally, with real plans, that we'll sit and zoom in into the culture and work with the culture, work with what's said, that's going to make a lot more sense and it's going to work a lot better. Thank you, Minister uh, M.K. Pindris, for your uh, remarks. We really enjoyed having you here. We really appreciate you taking the time. I want to thank you for your really lifelong service to the state of Israel, both in the military and in government, and, and finally for uh, being among those who do preserve our tradition and carry it forward for future generations. So thanks again for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. And uh, it was a pleasure. I really hope that for the next four years, I won't appear on a Zoom for elections over here, and I'll host to Jerusalem for better uh, events. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh